Okay, so the way we're going to do uh, this session, uh, the unplug session, is anybody wants to ask a question, uh, stand up at the mic. Uh, you will be on the camera, so if you're too embarrassed to do that, just put your hand up. I'll bring you the, the mic and you can ask that, but you won't be on the camera. Okay, all right, so we'll start from the front. What's, what's happening with Mono now that Microsoft owner? Are you going to merge the libraries into core? And then disband mono or keep them both. So, so Miguel's the you know, and, and the folks at Xamarin own that, although they are like a you know a, a division of Microsoft. But the idea is that remember what mono was and how it got built. Mono was a kind of a clean room at the time implementation where they made an, an implementation of .NET by not looking at the code. We came up with patent promises and all of these things to change the licensing to make it much more friendly. So now they can go and look at .NET Core code and refactor via subtraction rather than having their own implementation of string.length and all that kind of stuff, which was done, again, by not looking at the .NET code. They can go and take that stuff. So if they wanted, they could take Roslyn, they could take the BCL, they could take bits of it. I think what you're going to see is that Mono will still run in more places than Core. They've got it running all over the place because remember that hacker culture we talked about before? No one ever expected any support with Mono. So someone, you know, some 12-year-old girl in Denmark decides to get it running on a PlayStation 2. <coughs> cool. She doesn't expect it to, like, be supported. She just thinks it's cool. That kind of culture around Mono, we're trying to get that excitement around .NET Core. But if someone makes a great library in .NET Core or a great library in Mono, you should be able to use those things. For example, we don't have image resizing right now on .NET Core. But there's great Mono libraries that will do that. You can use those over, over on uh, .NET Core. But the focus of Mono right now is to be a .NET full framework cross-platform replacement that supports Xamarin's needs and their wants. Well, .NET Core is not a UI framework. It's a server-side thing that runs currently on six Linuxes. So they, they will coexist. But we now have three frameworks. We have .NET, we have Mono, we have .NET Core. What you'll see, though, is the .NET standard library that we haven't talked about will be the thing that you'll learn. If you're familiar with Android, any Android developers, they have this thing called API levels. Because there's 68 million different kinds of Android devices. And there's a million different flavors. And you typically say, I'm going to support API level 15. And that tells me that I have these functions. And if you do that, it supposedly works everywhere. You deal with screen size changes, but that's the thing. .NET standard library will be like that. You won't say, I'll support .NET Core 1 or .NET 4.6. You'll say, this is a .NET standard library library that supports level 1.3 or level 1.5. And then there's a table that will show you that it'll work on an Xbox, and it'll work on Windows, and it'll work on Linux. And then we'll add stuff to that. And the same thing we'll be able to say, and it'll run on Mono. So that's, that's the idea. But no, Mono doesn't die. Mono doesn't go away. It, mono is still mono, and mono is still good and still used, and uh, you're going to see it being used in other stuff. But remember that the goal of .NET Core is to make ASP.NET and server frameworks great. And the goal of mono is to make Xamarin great. Is that a good answer? All right, cool. Good question. I might steal the yeah, go for it. Um, you mentioned, thanks for coming down here, by the way, oh, yeah, to sure. Australia in yeah, general. Yeah. Brought my family um, and everything. You mentioned something about tree shaking or tree trimming um, and doing like uh, static uh, analysis of the language of, of your code to determine what you can trim out. Does that mean the moment I use anything like dynamic or, or the reflection library, like does that mean I can no longer use tree trimming or whatever it's called? So it's uh, a, a feature that they're working on that will probably be a year or two out, and I know about as, what, as much as I told you because that's what Damien said, and he was told by someone else. So I understand that we're, we're playing telephone here. But the idea is that, as I understand it, there's multiple levels to this. Are, are we being streamed at this point? Yes. We are. So to the best of my knowledge, as, <laughs> for example, there's one level which is I add a NuGet package, and then I don't use anything in that package, forgetting about reflection for a second, yeah. and then I package it up. It figures out that I didn't use any of that stuff, and then it doesn't ship it. That's one level, at the package level. And that's why they're broken up like that. Then there's some theoretical other possible future level where it knows down to the function what it does. If you go and do reflection, and what you're asking is, if I go around it and start calling methods, how does it know that I do that and then not accidentally trim out that stuff? I have no idea. Cool. All right. Yeah. I'm sure that that's such an, and no disrespect, that's such an obvious question 
to, to tree trimming that I am sure that the PhDs that are designing it are thinking about that. But that's a kind of question that you could ask on Twitter to like Bertrand, Bertrand Leroy or Emo Landverse and they will talk about it on the .NET show. But I want to make sure you're clear, this is far future stuff. This is not tomorrow, it's not Christmas. Sweet. But it's, it's the idea that in a world where .NET native happens, you want to be able to ship the tiniest bit possible. You don't want to ship a 250 meg .NET framework to say hello world. You want to trim it down to nothing. Good question. Hi, does uh, .NET Core um, trim down, is it itself trimmed down? So for example, as a, a silly example might be for console write line and console write, you know, they do similar things. You can always achieve console write line using just write. So let's get rid of the write line command. Is that part of what's happened with um, .NET Core in terms of trimming the they, API or that yeah. sort of thing? So they've gone through the API when they were designing CoreFX and removed stuff that they thought was not necessary. Uh, I think that example is kind of too trivial to use, though. But when I have questions like that, I do two things. I go to like this one site, which is called sourceof.net. People really don't know that this exists. Sourceof.net. And then I can go and type in like console and go to the console. This is the actual source of the console. And then look for right line. And it's got a bunch of overrides. So it looks like right line calls right and then right line, which is the you know the system dot environment dot end line or whatever it's called, right? And then I could go over to the core FX framework at GitHub. I'm totally guessing, by the way. He asked a question I don't know how to answer. <laughs> no, I know, but it's a good question. And the point I'm making is that I don't know any more than you do, but I can go and look it up. <laughs> you know what I mean? So um, yeah, I don't know. But they are, yes, it is trying to be refactored, but it also has to be refactored in a way that is, um, that is compatible. Does that make sense? So you can go and find those kinds of things. It looks like source.system.console. So you go and find the, th and I think there's a way. What's the thing in it's focus search bar? Is it that one? What's the thingy, the file searchy thing in, Git, in, in GitHub, you guys? I just hit um, question mark on GitHub, and it's all like you can have, um, you know about this? Almost every great website has the feature where you push the question mark button and it brings up the uh, hotkeys. A lot of people ask me, because I have a lot of followers on Twitter, what I use for a Twitter client. I use Twitter, uh, the website. Because if you hit the question mark button, it brings up these hotkeys. If you go to the Azure portal, hit the question mark button. Did you know the Azure portal has Vim key bindings to move around inside of it without using the keyboard? Um, so I just hit this one here. Um, I believe that there is a way inside of here to say GC go to code and then start typing. How do you do it? Well, I know find, oh, find file means I have to click a button, though. That's not as fun as, um, as doing something with the keyboard. There you go, system.console. <coughs> I know that this is not what you asked, but it, it's a good way to answer that question. Yeah, so you can basically look at this and you can tell it's the same code, you know what I mean? So did they use that as an opportunity? I don't know. I wouldn't say it was a complete rewrite, you know? They moved stuff over, they thought this overload's not needed or people are gonna need that overload. They had to look at things like the file watcher, that whole watch thing that I showed you, that's NTFS specific. That's a polling file watcher on Linux or Mac because they don't have pub sub. So there's, there's some cross-platform stuff where it's did the implementation change? And there's some cross-platform stuff where it's like, oh, let's just make this prettier while we're here. The let's make it prettier while we're here aspect of refact refactoring and .NET Core can be dangerous because you do it for your sense of beautification of the framework, but that makes it one more thing that someone who's trying to port code has to do. And people don't like that. So if we go to a Bing or an Xbox or a Stack Overflow or a giant company that says, hey, we want to move to .NET Core, we have 850 projects we want to port. That's going to be tens of thousands of warnings. And then if we move something to make it pretty or we trim something to make it pretty, they can't move it. 
we have found out that while we made a very small core, people want their helper functions. They want their overloads. So we're going to put a lot of those back to make porting easier. But by doing tree trimming or package trimming, it'll still keep it a small, tight framework because it's all optional. Does that make sense? Good questions. Someone here and then someone there. Is that OK? Yeah. Thanks again for coming. Um, I just wanted to ask you, you also have released Python tools for Visual Studio and R tools for Visual Studio. And uh, there's a huge integration R of R into SQL Server, Power BI, you know, a bunch of tools that sure, sure. you guys have. How do you see the integration going forward, the strategy of integration going forward? With integration Python? to what? Visual Studio? To Visual Studio and also integration, closer integration with .NET, being able to run R or Python con from Code well, from so if you, uh, if you look at things like EdgeJS, right, which was Tomaz's uh, let's make it so I can call .NET from Node and things like that, or Python uh, from .NET, there's always someone who wants to make a bridge to go and do stuff like that. Uh, I think while those things are interesting and sometimes academic and sometimes useful, at the same time, uh, you, it's, it's common for people to think that everyone wants those things. But as soon as you take language and language and then look for the intersection and then ask how many people want to call this thing from that thing, it is almost always much smaller than we would expect. You know what I mean? Even if it's like a million people use this and a million people use that, they should totally make a bridge. A couple of thousand people will use it. So I don't think you're going to see, you know, formalization of like making it super easy to call R from .NET or .NET from R, but you'll always see somebody going and doing something cool like that. The problem is with like something like EdgeJS as an example, um, when they go and make things like that, like they make a whole website, it's amazing, run node and .NET in process, da 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 how cool is this? And he makes a whole website about it. And then if you go to his GitHub, it's full of people complaining like, what's this for? Why would you do this? This is stupid. <laughs> what problems does this solve? So then... <laughs> So, you know, it sounds like you have that problem. So there's probably something that solves it. But when I, that is the question, that is the answer that you give people is that, yeah, if you have that problem, you solve it. But uh, do I personally, again, my opinion, see major things with integration? I think the people just want the excitement first of running it in Visual Studio. And it also gives more value to Visual Studio. And it juxtaposes the difference between Visual Studio code, which is a code editor, and it will never be Visual Studio for Mac, right? Look elsewhere for that kind of stuff. Visual Studio is an integrated IDE that does all sorts of great stuff. And if you're doing .NET Core and doing Python or doing R all inside of Visual Studio, then yeah, you're going to want something like this. Make sense? Thanks. Yep. Great Thank questions. You. How convenient that there was a quote on GitHub uh, that talked about that in the back. I thought there was a question in the back there behind you, Adam. Like 180 okay. degrees behind you. All right. Sorry, just trying to keep it fair. Uh, I have a question regarding JavaScript. Uh, if you start learning a new technology, which one would you rather pick, uh, Angular or React, and why? <laughs> I need to update this post. Um, I talk about that here in <laughs> my, my books. Um, I would learn JavaScript and a systems language. If the choice is Angular or React, it doesn't matter. Learn them both. Pick the one that makes you happy. Pick the one that solves the problem that you want to solve that day. That's like saying, should you lose WinForms or WPF, right? It's still going to make a button. It's still going to make a UI. You should be learning MVC as a model. Uh, as, a, uh, as a way of thinking. You should be learning MVVM. You should be learning reactive programming, not React. You know what I mean? Learn how to drive a stick shift, and you can drive anywhere in the world. Does that make sense? That's what I think. You mentioned uh, .NET Core as a server-side thing for um, yeah, running behind it web infrastructure. Is that the... Are there other usages envisaged for .NET Core as well, or is that is that its primary focus? So will will it be will you be able to run, you know, desktop apps or something off it, or use it for other 
things. Um, right. So remember what we said before about the difference between supported and possible, right? So I'm on visuals. I'm on uh, Windows Anniversary Edition, right? So now I can run Bash, and uh, run. And this isn't just Bash. This is this is Ubuntu. This is actual native Elf binaries. And the first thing that people tried to do was get Linux Windows to pop out of the thing. Not supported. Works. Totally not supported. So go with God. Uh, <laughs> if you can do something like that, great. Uh, WPF is never going to go to Linux. But there's a really cool open source project called Avalonia. Avalon was the code name for WPF before it was released. Avalonia is cross-platform WPF. Not a Microsoft thing, not supported by us, but super cool. So do I think .NET could be used in other cool ways? Absolutely. Uh, another absolutely amazing thing that you should check out, and all of you should give this person money immediately, uh, is a thing called Continuous. It's a C-sharp IDE for the iPad. That means IntelliSense. If you have an iPad Pro, look at this. Watch him change the code on the right-hand side and the code runs on the left and doesn't miss a beat. That's real. Like, that's not fake. There's no play button. He did that by forking Roslyn. Roslyn is the C-sharp compiler. Wrote the entire UI in F-sharp. None of this is allowed or supported, right? I mean, allowed. It's all in quotes. He forked Roslyn, did his own thing, and he's rebasing and keeping track. That's the kind of innovation that we want happening with things like .NET Core. Is it, uh, you know, do, what do we envision? I didn't envision that. So I don't have an answer for you other, to, other than to say, it's open source. Let's see what happens. Does that make sense? I know it's not the, yes, we're going to do this, or yes, we're going to do that. Right now, we are trying to make the best server-side framework we can, period. That is what we are trying to do. That is the goal. We can't do anything else until we get that right. I just want to clarify. Please. Is that the core intent at the moment is server-side framework? The core intent with .NET Core is the server-side framework, period until it's not. <laughs> I haven't seen or heard of any other work other than to make it the best node and go compete as possible. It wants to be the fastest, the best on its own merits so that people might put it in Docker or Amazon or Google Cloud or whatever makes them happy so that people will go, hey, C Sharp's really cool and use it because they, you know, they get tired of Node, they get tired of Go or whatever. That's my opinion. That's what we're working on. Any other questions? You got a question? What's up, sir? Hi, Scott. Um, in relation, if we look back five years, the way things were developed five years ago and, and the things we were working on, how do you characterize the changes to where we are today? And if you were to project forward another five years, where, where do you sort of see the next um, set of changes occurring? And, and the curly one, if you were to progress, uh, look further out, do you think artificial intelligence will ever come into the space of programming? Or? Trying to think about what I was doing 20 years ago. I was in an IDE, and I was in Turbo Pascal, and then I was doing Delphi, and I had IntelliSense, and I had objects, and I made cross-platform applications, and I was doing thunking, between 64-bit and 32-bit. And I was using AOL's smarter child bot that I would talk to with text messaging. And now it's 20 years later, and I'm pretty much doing the exact same thing. <laughs> Except I use Skype to talk to a bot, and it doesn't seem that much smarter. Siri still doesn't understand me when I talk. <laughs> Basically, the only thing that's changed is higher resolution. And, uh, and the kids don't care about memory. Um, <laughs> so, like, lots has changed, but in 20, 25 years, not too much has changed. Um, I don't know enough to answer that question. Uh, but I will say that um, we tend to, as a group, to very much overestimate uh, what the power of the machine will have rather than the portability. If you look at things like... Um, uh, Gibson's books and, you know, a Snow Crash and uh, what's the Manser one? Uh, tech Neuromancer. Neuromancer? Yeah. I don't know how to type. It doesn't really matter. Yeah, William Gibson's Neuromancer. 
One of the funny things about Neuromancer is that he predicted so many aspects of the internet, except the portability of the phone. You know, he's got to jack into the phone on the corner. So no one saw that coming, you know what I mean? Uh, but if you, and if you look at uh, Star Trek The Next Generation, uh, it seems to have completely <coughs> predicted the iPad, but totally missed out on Bluetooth. And they're still docking things and plugging things in. So yeah, I'm not a good futurist at all. But uh, I suspect that it will be less amazing than we will see, but it will, than, we, than we would think. But it'll definitely be more portable than we would think. But I don't know. That's a good question. He has a good question. Go talk to him at the bar and see if you can uh, get him drunk and get more out of him, because that was good <laughs> stuff. All right. Yeah. Uh, I've received an SMS, and so I'll read that one to you. Basically, so uh, Rando just texted you a question. Yes. <laughs> So basically it's about, um, he wants to move a whole lot of stuff to Azure, hasn't done it before. To and Azure? Azure. Okay. And he says, uh, you've mentioned in the past not to use free Azure services. Is there a way to run free Azure services and just see what the cost would be as if it was a paid subscription so you could adapt your architecture to suit your budget? No. <laughs> <laughs> No, so, I mean, I don't know who that person is or what they're trying to do, but I will say this, uh, pay for value. You know, we'll sit there and debate whether we should spend five bucks on an, I on an iPad app, but we'll buy a $5 latte. Uh, people will come to me and they want the $50 a month uh, Azure credit. You're a freaking programmer. Pay the money. <laughs> See if it works, and if it doesn't work, shut it off. You know what I'm saying? Uh, that doesn't mean buy a large Azure instance for $200 and leave it running all night and make 10 of them going. It means make the smallest possible paid, Azure, Amazon, Google, I don't care, service that you can and try it out and see. I doubt it will cost you a million dollars if you run it for a day. So yeah, pay the couple of grand or whatever it's going to take to prove your concept and then shut it off. That's the thing. The cloud isn't hosting. The cloud is boom quad processor machine with 20 gigs of RAM for an hour. Shut it off, stop paying. That's the cloud. So yeah, no, the answer is no. Have you ever seen anybody kind of writing automated uh, tests to do it one way, and work out costs, and do it another way? And no, hmm. because in the amount of time it would require, that's just a typical programmer thing to do, which is like spend 99 days designing the thing so you can push the button at the end. <laughs> You know, it's a total programming thing to do, but are you really going to do that? You're saying, like, try different combinatorics of architectures? I think I've seen things where people might say, I have a multi-layered architecture where the product catalog is on four machines and the shopping cart's on ten and the back-end database is on three, and you make a bunch of slider bars and you try different tests and you can go and do the combinatorics of that. Sure, that seems reasonable. But that doesn't change the fundamentals of the architecture. You have to do it decoupled and do it correctly first. Uh, yeah, so yes and no on that one. OK. Is that a good, is that OK? Yeah. You, know, you guys know what I'm trying to say, right? Yeah. Pay the money. <laughs> I think we're up to Dave. Yes, sir. Yeah, well, thanks for the Azure Fridays. I found them really good. And as far as your comments, yeah, we definitely have played around with do we run a G5 or do we run multiple D15s and that sort of stuff. Yeah, so just try it out. We play with it. Yeah, just don't leave them on overnight. Yeah, it gets expensive. Because it'll get expensive, yeah. yeah. Um, one thing I'm pondering, a lot of the stuff that we looked at today, often there seems to be a bit of Microsoft magic where you click on it and it magically downloads the bits that you need, which is really convenient in most places until you get to the enterprise where they've locked everything so <coughs> tightly, yeah, yeah, nothing yeah. goes on, and it takes ages to try and figure out how to get this stuff down through the firewall. Has ever any thought been given to either documenting where that stuff comes from or letting us sort of suck it down and then repoint to Yeah, so there's a, there's a couple, that's a great question. So there's a couple ways that you can do that. First, you can go and say .NET <coughs> publish, and that will suck everything down on your development machine, put literally everything you need into a folder, okay. and then you copy it over to the air-gapped server. So that's possible today. When you do a publish, it makes a copy of exactly what you need and starts that trimming process that yeah, we talked about. Then your team about. can build off that. And then your team can build off that. That's one way to do it. If the machine that you're working on is air-gapped or is somehow locked down, then you would set up a, uh, a, a basically a mirror of the NuGet 
or a filtered NuGet, or you would go and get a company, and I think there's one called Sonatype, Software Automation and Security, and they have an application. This is a really interesting concept. Imagine that your company would only allow MIT licensed NuGets. And people keep getting NuGets that are GPL'd or whatever because they go to NuGet directly. You get their product and they give you a filtered NuGet feed that only has the approved NuGets. Then you go to everyone's machine or you use group policy. You get rid of NuGet.org. You plug in that filtered NuGet that is private to your company and then only allowed and approved ones are, are, are set up. You can also do that by just setting up a, a, an internal NuGet server. So you can say NuGet server Hanselman. Um, I just put Hanselman at the end of everything. Uh, <laughs> so be, basically how to host your own NuGet you, server you, internal to your company that has approved stuff. stuff yeah. Exactly. And then let the, let the corporate overlords decide when a new version should be allowed, bring it down, and then copy it over to the NuGet. Especially handy if it's most of it's through port 80 sure. rather than creating another port. Absolutely. Uh, also, I just learned this. Visual Studio Team Services offers private NuGets. So if you're already using VSTS, they'll make a NuGet, and it'll pop out the other side when you say, like, artifacts. And the other thing that I use is a thing called AppVayor. Hanselman. Um, and AppVayor is continuous integration system that will explicitly make NuGets and then publish them to a NuGet server that you can then use as well and then send to your air gap systems. Cool. Thanks, Scott. Good questions. Cool. We good? I'm running out of gas. Yep. We've got five minutes to go. Um, more, more randos texting you? Is that what's going no, on? No, no. <laughs> this is my question. Um, oh, it's your question. Of your uh, Hansel minutes, what are your top three? Top three of my your show? Your favorite ones. Well, that's going to, I don't want to say that publicly. Um, top three Hansel minutes. Keishao Rogers is one of my most popular shows ever. Uh, I, everyone was talking about doing, uh, teaching kids to code. And then I was blogging about teaching kids to code. And she says, no, we should not teach kids to code. We should teach them to think about systems. And they'll figure out how to code. And that was like, she came on the show. And I said, you have to come on my show and talk about that. People freaking love that show because it's really true. It's understanding how systems work and fit together. And by systems, it means could be architectural systems. Or like I was actually talking to a, a woman at, um, at NDC today. She said her 15-year-old daughter does the accounting for her. She's an independent consultant. It's like, oh my goodness, how do you, why do you let her do that? And she's like, I want her to see how the world works. And nothing shows you how the world works than dealing with A&P and A&R and, and all that kind of stuff. So now our kid's going to Stanford with an understanding about how the system works from an economics perspective. So systems thinking, that was a, just a deeply popular episode. And I would also say, oh, this one here. Simone Yetz is uh, the queen of crappy robots. Um, <laughs> Simone, I found, I had, I, I've had a lot of people on the show before they became famous. True story. Uh, she makes really, really horrible robots. And they're just so bad. <laughs> she's, just, she's just working on them. She made the wake-up machine. And she talks about how she made them and how they are made out with Arduinos and everything. And this one wanted to, she, she, she wants to, uh, to wake up in the morning to this, uh, I think I'm still on your phone, dude. So she got this thing <laughs> that would slap her in the face when, when, she, when she wakes up. So the idea is that she makes this robot <laughs> that would hit her in the head when she's asleep. <laughs> so that was a good episode, too. Uh, you got another question? Oh, a top three? Uh, this guy. 
Uh, I, I'm a fan of linguistics. I can speak a number of languages very poorly, uh, just enough to order food and get a taxi. And uh, this gentleman here was hired for, with the, by the Sci-Fi Channel for the show called The Expanse to create a language for the belters, the people who live in the asteroid belt. A couple of people were nodding their heads. He invented the language. Um, that's actually a great one. And actually another one was uh, Minority Report. Minority Report. Uh, they hired a guy from MIT to say, what would the future look like in 2054? And he actually had to go and generate in his mind and on paper, okay, well, this happened in 2020, and this happened in 2030, and that affected this thing all the way up to the point where here's what the world looks like in a theoretical future. And then all of the background action in the television show that was dictated based on those things that happened in the world. Those are both really cool shows. They're all good. I've received, I've received an SMS from downstairs. Uh, are there Scott, people who aren't in this room? Yeah, there's an overflow room downstairs. Oh. They, didn't, they didn't fit in. That sucks. Okay. They were I late, they were late Scott. I'll we, see you. we nearly put you downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> Ask Scott, when will we get another This Developer's Life? Uh, I've got another show called This Developer's Life. That's also a pretty good show. And uh, we're actually halfway through recording the next episode. This show is a lot more complicated. It's like it's an hour plus long show with musical interludes and stuff. It's a passion project. It's not again. It's all volunteer type stuff. But it took like I I, edit, I edited this one the 45 minutes of this show here entirely myself. This show uh, that uh, my wife and I did, who's in the back. Uh, she had cancer, and we spent the year talking about that. And I took a year's worth of audio and turned it into an uh, an hour of like the entire cancer year. That took us, oh lord, 45 hours to edit. So when people go, hey, can you give me another show? I appreciate that you love the show, but the amount of work is so immense. So yeah, when it's done. <laughs> but we are working on one right now. Me and Rob are. So I, Thanks for since, listening since to that. We've got two minutes to go. I'll ask the last question since I don't see any others. Um, you've been doing these community stand-ups, and uh, I, I really thought uh, I was just wondering: did any? They're a little bit like doing a sprint review, uh, or you know, a daily scrum. Yeah, it's but a you're scrum, except yeah, you're there. But you're uh, you're sharing with the whole world. Mm -hmm. Has anyone like been inspired from that and then started broadcasting their? Yeah, the .NET team. We started the ASP.NET community stand-up, and then the .NET team said, that's cool, and they did the same thing. So other groups at Microsoft, just talk, are, they call us. Office is talking about doing one, Windows. And outside of Microsoft, has anyone started live streaming their daily? I've their never heard anyone SP doing reviews. that, but yeah. they could totally do that. All right. So with that, I'd just like to thank Scotty for coming. And I'd like to thank everyone that put this together tonight, Raj, David, Bridget, Brittany, all the team. There's a lot of people that put it together, the builders. Uh, it was fantastic and it all panned out. And if you want to continue the fun, head to the Oaks. Cheers. The Oaks. <laughs>